Welcome to the Investment Immigration Podcast by uglobal.com. I'm your host, Salman Siddiqui from Berlin. Today, we are going to focus on Antigua and Barbuda's program. There are many jurisdictions in the Caribbean, but Antigua usually comes out on top. It's considered one of the most popular ones. Now, why is that? Is it because of its many tax benefits? Is it because its donations options are considered cheaper? Or is it more of the same? It just has better marketing. So which option to choose from the Caribbean? Today, I have a very special guest with me who's going to explain to us about Antigua and Barbuda's program, what makes it special. And the good thing is, my guest is actually right now in Antigua and Barbuda. So welcome to the show, Kevin. Kevin Hosam is the founder and director for EC Holdings. And uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I am indeed in Antigua today. Another beautiful sunny morning over here in the tropics. It's indeed a pleasure. Fantastic. So, I mean, are you there for business or is it, uh, you know, you're just there for some off time? What's what's the latest buzz in Antigua? What can you share uh, the latest developments from there, especially well, with its uh, program? Yeah, well, to be honest, I am actually an Antiguan citizen um, and I have I grew up here in Antigua. My main office for myself is in Antigua. Our company headquarters is in Singapore. Uh, we do have a number of offices worldwide in EC Holdings, notably in places like uh, Dubai, um, Latvia, Nigeria, um, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia, Vietnam, um, and a few other jurisdictions. And um, but but my my main office is in uh, Antigua and. Um, I've been working in this program for quite a while, um, since 2014. And uh, previously to that, I was working in the other Caribbean CBI uh, programs, notably uh, through Sinkits with another company. And um, Antigua is buzzing right now because it is, it is a, it, it's a very good program. It's, it's very family oriented, very family welcoming, I should say. And I think Antigua is very proud of that. If you know it as a tourism destination, it's also known as a very uh, tourism, uh, family-friendly tourism vacation destination and even couples destination. So we deal predominantly with with families, uh, even in that market. So it's like a, you know, a, a swing off of, of that. Antigua is a great country, very good country, and I'm excited to dive into it with you today. Fantastic. So, Kevin, please uh, share with our viewers, firstly, if you could give us an overview of uh, the Citizenship by Investment program there. And uh, like you mentioned, it's been um, out there for a long time now. So what has changed over the years in your experience and what kind of options are still there? I mean, we know there's the donation op option and then the real estate option, right? Uh, and what are the nuances uh, between those two? So if you could just give us a general overview for our listeners. Sure, no problem. So Antigua's program started in 2013. They introduced it uh 2013 and um since then it has built a momentum it has evolved into more of a family welcoming program and i will get into that um why i say that and why i will stress that but antigua um has multiple options for persons to obtain a second citizenship they can go through uh four particular options the first one being obviously the most uh popular would be the government donation, which is called the National Development Fund. This donation helps to build uh, infrastructure on the island, uh, much needed infrastructure. As you know, we're only 108 square miles, so not a huge population. It helps with assisting the government in, 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 in uh, the shortfalls in, in, in uh, their budgetary you know, constraints. Then we have um, the real estate option, which is also a very uh, popular option. It was a lot more popular previously. And the reason for that is because a lot of the Antiguan 
properties that were built from 2013 have completed and sold out. So there are not as much options as we would have seen a few years ago. The other option that we have quite popular and gaining momentum, which is a new option, would be the University of the West Indies. Now, this option is really geared at larger families. And that comes back to what I've been saying, where it's a family-oriented program. The University of the West Indies option starts with six applicants. So you have to have a minimum of six applicants in your family to, to obtain this option. Whereas the National Development Fund donation and the real estate can go from one up through five or whatever. But ultimately, the best option for larger families in Antigua would be through the University of the West Indies uh, Fund. And a very good spinoff to this option is once they invest into this fund, obviously it is named after the University of the West Indies, which is one of the campuses for the University of the West Indies here in Antigua. Uh, there are four in total. Your, one of your kids or someone in your family would be able to attend that school for one year free tuition. So it's like an investment that you're getting something back out of also for future, which is really fantastic. And then you have the business investment. The business investment is one of those that are of a larger investment amount where you're, you're investing into already established businesses. So there are four options, four very unique options. The most obviously, um, chosen option would be the National Development Fund. And, and families, like I said, are very much welcomed because Antigua has a very like deep meaning of a dependent compared to the other CBI programs out there. So uh, in terms of the families, I mean, all four options give that right to foreign applicants to bring their families, right? But let's talk about uh, this new option that you just mentioned, uh, the University of West Indies fund option. So why is this more attractive for families now? Is it because the the number of families that one can bring uh, under this fund is six and compared to other options, the number varies or is it the same? Well, the uniqueness about the Antigua program is, so for example, if we had a client that chose the National Development Fund. Perhaps I wouldn't say the word chose, but if, if we consulted a client and we noticed his family was between one to five, it will definitely go towards the National Development Fund. I would recommend that because uh, in certain cases, it, it will be cheaper than the University of the West Indies Fund. However, if you were to go and add a sixth person onto the National Development Fund, it actually gets more expensive than the university fund. The university fund starts at 150,000 investment. It's capped at 150,000. What makes it very unique is the government processing fees for the first six people are included in that 150,000. So if we're to do the mathematics and the costing of and comparisons of uh, a family makeup, a family of four, the investment, or one to four, the investment in the donation would be 100,000. However, one to four persons must pay an additional 30,000 processing fees, whereas one to six are paying 150,000, and it includes the processing fees. If you were to add family members onto the National Development Fund, you will you'll be adding 15,000 per dependent for the processing fees. So it, it, it actually becomes using the University of the West Indies cheaper than going through the, nas the, the National Development Fund option. So the larger families are actually getting uh, uh, more cost uh, effective through this option. One of the ways that I would always encourage applicants to look at the, the costing of their application. Let's say they had three family members and the total cost was 160000 You divide that by three and you'll be able to see, okay, my citizenship is going to cost X amount. But then when you divide the family of six 
by the hundred and let's say seventy five thousand that it's going to cost total or one hundred and eighty thousand, you you would realize that the amount amount per person actually goes down. So your citizenship is getting cheaper by the amount of persons that are actually applying. So it, it becomes very attractive for larger families. Now, uh, I said from couples, again, it's the same. If one person was applying through the National Development Fund, they will be paying 100000 as the investment. And they will be still paying the, the 30000 for the government processing fees. If four persons or two persons or three persons were applying in that family, they're paying the same amount as the single applicant. Now, obviously, the more the more persons you have on, on the application, quite contrary to a lot of the other programs, per individual, it doesn't get cheaper. But in Antigua, it does. So that is quite interesting for larger families. The larger the family, the less cost it is per individual. Indeed, and that is interesting for a lot of uh, large families. But I want to also understand how Antigua... Uh, defines uh, a family are just direct um, descendants, for example, um, a, a couple and their children are considered family or can one bring, say, one's brother or sister or parents in that same application? Yeah, so that's um, very interesting. That is something that the Antigua Citizenship by Investment Unit put into place uh, just about two years ago or uh, a little less, but uh, well, one of the last islands to actually implement, you were able to bring siblings, your siblings. So a principal applicant of an application or even the spouse uh, would be able to bring a sibling uh, uh, onto the application. And again, unlike a lot of the other programs, bringing a sibling, there's no added fee because they're a sibling. So in other words, in Antigua, I just explained the investment is 100,000, the processing fees are 30,000. You can add your sibling to that application without any added cost because they're a sibling. In other jurisdictions, you would have to perhaps pay, in some, not all, you would have to pay an additional fee because they're a sibling, no matter even if they fall within that you know, range of the amount of persons in a family. Now, what's interesting about the siblings is a sibling, once they're not married, they could be of any age, and they do not have to show dependency on the principal applicant. So that is also very unique. What other programs would say, okay, they have to be under the age of 18 to be a sibling and can be included. Other programs will say, okay, they could be of any age. However, they have to be dependent on the principal applicant. Again, totally opposite to Antigua. So it's this, adding a sibling in Antigua has, is a very attractive proposition for persons who are looking to for that type of application. Indeed, We it also is. are able to add dependents. Now, these dependents, so for example, the principal applicant can add his parents once they're over the age of 55, and they can show dependency. And they are able to add their kids to the application once they can show dependency under the age of 30. Once, once if, for example, a, a child, we, we get caught up in the whole realm of, of oh, dependency when well, my son is living in his apartment in the city, he's making a small uh, salary. You know, I would always recommend uh, persons to consult with us and then we will be able to give them the exact Yes, he is considered a dependent or no, he's not considered a dependent. Just don't take it upon your own initiative. We've been doing it for a very long time. And, you know, we're able to say, hey, yes, your son is indeed a dependent and or no, you know, it's there's there's certain things that we can take into consideration to determine if they qualify, you know, I see. because over the age of 25 gets a little bit funny. I mean, are they fully dependent or are they not? And, and we'll be able to consult them the best way and, and determine, you know, if, if, if they are indeed eligible. Right. And uh, tell us, um, when this fund was actually la launched, was it recent or has it been around? It's just becoming more popular now. Uh, are you speaking about the University of the West? Exactly. Yes. 
that was actually launched around the same time as when they implemented the siblings, which was just around 2020, end of 2020, mid 2020. So it is somewhat of a new fund. The fund was was implemented or introduced, I should say, into our citizenship program when um, Antigua was afforded the opportunity to house the fourth campus of the University of the West Indies. Now, the good thing about it is the University of the West Indies is, is known to be a very good university. And also, it is usually only seen in the larger islands, such as Trinidad and Tobago has a campus of Barbados and Jamaica. Now, these are the larger islands in the Caribbean. So Antigua having a campus, particularly the only OECS island to have a campus, the only CBI island to have a campus is very impressive, very impressive. And it was it was the government's it, it, the, the government really pushed for it. The prime minister really pushed and uh, ensured that Antiguans got the ability to get that higher education on soil. For that, they created this uh, investment option to help sustain it. Right. And, you know, but there's a key difference between these um, fund options and national endowment donation option. They're both donation uh, based, isn't it? And yes. But most foreign applicants also, in many countries, they like to invest in property and buy real estate because then they can eventually sell those properties and maybe, you know, get their money back. So uh, let's talk about the other option that's uh, that's there, which is the real estate option. And I mean, from what I heard was that a lot of Americans prefer to buy their vacation homes in Antigua as a second home and uh, especially in recent years. So could you also share uh, with our listeners what you have observed over the years, especially from people from North America, who have come to Antigua to uh, make the investments, which route is their preferred route? Yeah, so um, actually, I'm I'm really happy to hear you say that. Um, Antigua is well known for a large expat population, which are what some people would categorize as snowbirds coming down in the winter time for eight, nine months per year, you know, to get away from the weather. Perhaps work remotely or something like that and a lot of them actually make it their home even at retirement um, these expats now the citizenship by investment program got quite popular with North Americans and even Europeans uh, around the time of COVID pre-COVID very 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 few persons were actually speaking about it in these jurisdictions and what we have noticed is yes they do um have a mix of requests. Yes, they want to do a donation because they feel like they would like to donate to the to the building of the island. And they do have persons who also say, I would like to make an actual real estate investment. I will be honest and say, when I do speak with particularly North Americans or Europeans, because I do know they would look at the Caribbean as definitely a second home and a place that they want to reside for most of the year. I would definitely ask them, you know, what is your intention? If your intention is to live here, perhaps you might want to think of buying something more permanent after you invest in the National Development Fund. Some still go the route on the real estate aspect. I personally believe in the real estate aspect. And I believe in good properties. Obviously, we all do. <laughs> we all believe in good real estate. Good real estate offers persons the opportunity to get returns on their investment. And it also offers them the opportunity to exit if they wish to exit. Okay. And if, if I do get clients um, who wish to invest in a real estate option, that is one of the things that I, I speak about with them. I want to ensure before they choose the real estate option, I want them to know what they're getting into, where they do have to hold it for five years. There's a holding period of five years. And I want them to know that, you know, the property that you're looking at now, if I did not introduce it to you, are you satisfied with the exit if there is one, if you do decide to exit after the holding period? The good thing about Antigua, the real estate here, is 
it's 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 a good option. And the reason for that is because the government actually introduced the real estate option to enhance the tourism product, to build on the amount of nights or overnight stays that the island receives per year. Before the Citizenship by Investment Program introduced this option, we had less rooms available for, for our, our tourist industry. So it was an encouragement for persons to build properties. Now, like I was saying in the beginning of the, the call, a lot of the real estate options have already been sold. We do have some new options on the market. And I do think quite a few of them are quite good. But I, I do encourage persons to do their research, particularly those who are looking to come and live here and live here full time or at least an extended period, because that is not necessarily the unit that you might want to live in. Again, these are these are built for mostly tourism accommodation. They are few properties that will allow long term living and they have CBI properties for that. And that is why, again, it comes back to when I speak with my clients about the CBI program and the real estate option in particular, I need to know what their goals are. And you tend to see, again, North Americans and Europeans wanting to come to Antigua. It is a beautiful island and it, it has a history of being very welcoming to, to these persons, you know, to, to make it a second home. Right. And. Do you think is is pandemic the only reason where uh, because uh, of which they are coming to Antigua? Or I mean, I heard this. I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but there are some some people have shared that that their clients also say it's because of the environment now in the U.S. that they just feel that having a second option in places like Antigua just makes them feel safer. You know, do you also hear that from your clients, especially those in the in the U.S.? Absolutely, every day. Anytime we get a call, when I said we started to get interest because of the pandemic, it was like the pandemic. 2020 was the opening, the reckoning for these persons to realize that a plan B is absolutely necessary. It wasn't necessarily just the, the, the pandemic, because if it was just the pandemic, we would not have the persons contacting us today still, you know, because that is basically behind of us. The whole COVID issue is a lot of us have put it behind of us. So we do hear about it. We hear, and I don't want to just pick on the, the U.S., but Canadians, Europeans, and even further afield, they talk about political issues. They talk about when we go back to the pandemic, they basically say they were unable to move. And because certain areas were hit harder in the pandemic, it opened up their eyes to their stock. And, and a lot of persons are not used to being stationed in one place for years. People want to be able to move. And not every nationality was allowing you to go to certain countries. So having options with citizenship allowed them to do that. That is where I, why I said it opened up their eyes. And it opened up their eyes to more issues, not only because of my movement, but also because of the political atmosphere. Some of them talk about war. We have a war going on right now in, in Ukraine. And we're seeing Eastern Europeans requesting citizenship by investment. And it's not because they would love to leave their home because they think it's no good. It's just that they want to have an option for security. We're, we're in the middle of the, or just on the edge of the Atlantic Ocean in the Gulf of Mexico. And we're not in the center of any war or conflict. So they look at this as, you know, a place of safety. And North Americans do that. Europeans are doing that. The entire world is doing that. The entire world. That's so true. And also, I want to understand from your perspective, because you mentioned you're from Antigua and you've been observing the trends for so long. So I'm also interested to know from you is, have you seen a shift in um, the age group of the applicants? Are you now seeing perhaps, is it just the retirees who are coming towards Antigua or, or do younger couples are also uh, considering it uh, as an option? And is this a recent trend? You know, that's a really good question. Recently, I'm seeing 
younger persons, younger entrepreneurs looking at this. Younger entrepreneurs, I think the mindset, I want to think I'm young. <laughs> the mindset has changed a little bit where we want to be free. We want to have that mobility. We want to, we, we don't want to be caught up in conflicts and, and wars. It's, a, it's like we, we're tired of it. And we're seeing younger persons. Right now, I would say the the age range is from about 35, 33 up to 70, 75. We've had 80 plus year olds apply. I've, I've actually done about a year ago an application for a person who is 90 years old who just said, you know, I feel like I need to get something because they're living over in Europe. And I was actually quite surprised at his age. He was thinking about that, you know. And it's not that he wanted to leave his country. It's just that he wanted that safety and safety net of having something in to migrate to a, a, a more stable, if that's the word I could use, in a war time. So, yeah, the applicants are younger now. I think with education and podcasts, like what we're doing, they're, they're becoming more aware of, of the necessity. Twitter, social media. It has opened a lot of eyes. Younger people are using these modes of um, education, like education opportunities that they get online, right. taking it in and they're applying. And right. yes, it wasn't necessarily like that five years ago, but it, it has evolved into younger, younger persons actually applying. And they're applying for themselves as single applicants or they're applying for their young family. But you see, we are getting the middle-aged 50, 50 plus who have a family applying and they're also applying for their kids because they're thinking about their future. And, and you know, they're saying, you know, well, I I'd like to get it for my kids and I'm not sure if they're necessarily going to use it, but perhaps, you know, when the time comes and it is necessary, they have an option that they can just get to some sort of refuge or safety or some secure place outside of, you know, some war battle. <laughs> so you get a lot of uh, persons saying different things. And yes, different ages now, for sure. Absolutely. Great. Great to hear that. And also, I would like to hear from you. What options do digital nomads have in Antigua and Barbuda? I mean, this is also a recent trend world over where, I mean, I think it's connected to the pandemic again, where many countries began to offer digital nomad visa. So I think Antigua has that option. And what trend are you seeing in that particular category? Is that on the rise or has that stabilized off? What are you observing there? Yeah, so Antigua does have a nomad um, visa. It introduced it about two years ago also, or a little bit more than that. It was actually one of the first countries to actually introduce a nomad visa. And it has been doing quite well for Again, you would see for the nomad visas, you're not seeing the younger persons. I will be honest, Antigua is not the cheapest area or place to live in. I mean, you can get a, a nomad visa in Southeast Asia and you could live quite easier on a, a less budget. But you are seeing families applying for this nomad visa. I did a family uh, a few months ago for a nomad visa from New Zealand. And, you know, they brought over their, their mother also, or the, 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 the mother of the, the principal. He brought over his mother, his kids, and his wife. And that was the last one that I did. The government just recently actually extended to continue doing the nomad visa. So it is, it is out there. Persons are looking at it who are considering, I would like to say, because a lot of them who do the nomad visa sometimes most of the time transition into a second citizenship to stay in the Caribbean because once they come here the way of life here is fantastic the Caribbean islands are well connected to through their airports to Europe and 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 North America so it's easy for them to get home if in the event that they need to leave it's easy for them to come and live here it's not extremely expensive however it's not on the cheap side like some countries in Southeast Asia would be so you do see persons transition from the nomad visa into the citizenship by investment program, which is actually quite, quite good. The government just extended it. So in my opinion, if they have extended it, then it must be doing pretty good. 
and right. and is a destination the person's like it's livable right i also want to touch upon something which you said earlier which which was about the applicants that are now coming from europe so let's talk a little bit more on that so we discussed how the impact of the ukraine war has been on so many countries programs where people are going from that region and seeking passports so what are you seeing there the trends from europe and are you getting more applicants you said from eastern europe but is there any particular country from where you're getting more applicants now and are you facing any difficulties in getting their applications approved because i hear this from a lot of other programs that for example for belarusian or russian applicants they can't even open a bank account so it's just uh, they don't bother so are you facing challenges uh, and what trends have you observed over the years from that region yeah so currently russians and belarusians are not permitted to apply in our program we do see uh, eastern europeans romanians you know moldovans persons from that region requesting second citizenship they're inquiring some of them have uh, already started applications when you speak with them and it's the general consensus when you speak with them again it's not that they hate their country per se it's just that they just want to have that comfort and and persons would say yeah but i can travel on my my current passport but how long can you stay in a country on your current passport you're giving an allotted amount of time per year if this thing really does escalate they're looking at perhaps we would have to move for a year or two or whatever the good thing about uh, an antiguan citizenship is yes you can come and live in antigua but also you can move through the oecs because you're part of the organization of eastern caribbean states so you're you're able to go and make a residence within another one of the countries that's part of the OECS. Right, right. Uh, so you're not necessarily confined to one island. But this you, trend is new, though. The the one that you just mentioned, that people, for example, applicants from Moldova are coming to Antigua, to, as far away as Antigua, to seek a second citizenship. This is something new, right? This didn't happen before. Yeah. So, I mean, you did get some inquiries previously, but not as much as you would get today. Not as much. You, you, you're even getting persons who were living or who have moved out of Ukraine, who have a Ukrainian um, citizenship, actually inquiring because they have Ukrainian. They prefer to have something else. Also, uh, most of them are not living in Ukraine at the moment. But, but you are seeing, let's say, for example, a R- Romanian families asking, and it is an uptick. Uh, previously to to 2021 or 2022, when this this conflict began, we would get inquiries. But now, on a normal basis, we're hearing a lot more um, on a daily basis. Per se, you know, we are getting inquiries. Not necessarily everybody's following through. Which they inquire and then they make decisions. They speak it over with their family, and and but it it it, it is a trend upward. It is a trend upward. And, and again, it comes back to education also. When, when persons hear about it, at first they may think, well, why do I need it? But after when they do understand the necessities of a plan B, they, they're definitely open-minded to it and, 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 and jump at the opportunity. They jump at the opportunity because it's citizenship within, let's say, five, six months. And it gives you those opportunities of, of, of living in a country that can assist you in rough times in terms of your security. It, 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 it's, it's a necessity right now. Right. And we are coming close to the end of our episode. But before I let you go, I also want to know about what trends you're seeing from other parts of the world. For example, are you seeing, um, you know, traditionally uh, applicants from Southeast Asia uh, would come to places like Canada, they would apply in so many other countries and 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 especially in the Caribbean too. Was was there a focus of, for example, Chinese applicants coming to Antigua or has that increased or stopped? What how what are you observing from that part of the world? So when I when when I first got into this um, investment migration industry, the majority of applicants were definitely from China. And I would say every region tend to fluctuate. China 
went down during the pandemic because a lot of uh, it was it was very difficult to obtain documents for them to move for them to to uh, you know to get from the government. I do see an uptick with them again. Chinese are definitely making those inquiries again. I am a promoter of all Caribbean CBI, and I do see Antigua um, being the predominant one being asked for. I think China will be a good uh, uh, one of the leading countries to be requesting second citizenship. Uh, every country has a reason, or every citizen in a, in a country has a reason for obtaining uh, citizenship. The pers- the persons in China may not be re- thinking about a second citizenship like uh, for the same reasons as an, a person in North America. They have totally different reasons. Some other jurisdictions, Southeast Asia, a few countries in there, Vietnam in particular, they're not requesting second citizenship per- for perhaps the same reason as Europeans also. So of course, I would say on a yearly basis, every year you see different trends. At the beginning of the year, you tend to see more of a con- more of one country requesting second citizenship than the other. Predominantly, right now, because China is now getting out of that whole lockdown scenario, you're getting a lot more requests. You're still seeing quite a number of requests throughout Africa, West Africa. You're getting a lot of requests out of North America, Europe, Southeast Asia. I I. I think, in my opinion, again, this this year, every every country that has been applying previously, it's going to increase. World is not getting stabler, <laughs> if that's right. a word. It's not, it's not as stable as it used to be. You know, there's a lot more conflicts, a lot more hardships, and persons are looking for that second option. And the Caribbean CBI, Antigua, um, offers that option uh, within a few months and it, there is an uptick and because Antigua is positioned as safe, well developed, decent healthcare, decent education, persons look at it and think, well, that is a very good option. It's a viable option for me and my family. I want to ask you this, you know, like, I mean, and this is also coming to the end of our show, this is the absolutely the last question. I mean, I want your take on the future of the Caribbean programs, including Antigua and Barbuda, in the context that we know that a lot of programs in the Caribbean are facing pressures from the European Commission, for example, they talk about due diligence processes. And of course, uh, a lot of countries' programs for their visa access to Europe is being, you know, scrutinized and they're asking questions of whether this should continue or not. Given that sort of context, how do you see briefly, if you could share with our listeners, the future of the Caribbean program and especially Antigua and Barbuda? There are a few ways we can answer that. It is a topic that people debate a lot and not everybody sees it the same way. I see Caribbean CBI here to stay at the moment. The governments look forward to the revenue. They need the revenue. They put the revenue into much needed projects to to assist with the development of the country. The Caribbean islands are, you know, they are small islands that are very prone to natural disasters. I mean, we will get the brunt of it. And we are, when it comes to the environment, we we pollute the le- the least, you know, but we are also on the the end of getting the most destruction. So the Caribbean islands need these programs to combat climate change uh, in terms of um, natural disasters. When when we do have these things, the government has to step in and as- assist their population. These larger countries who want to scrutinize the programs, we could speak about due diligence on a daily basis. Due diligence is something that, that I'm very... Um, I speak about very passionately because we do a due diligence, a rigorous due, due diligence uh, process on our applicants. I see it firsthand because I'm that bridge between the client and the CBI unit. And these programs are being scrutinized. Are we being scrutinized because we are asking high net worth individuals or we're allowing high net worth individuals an easier pathway to get a second citizenship than? persons looking to, now I don't want to say this badly, but are we are we scrutinizing the persons that are going through this rigorous process 
as opposed to persons who will be coming into a country through other means, other visa options that don't go through these, you know, rigorous due diligence processes. The, the due diligence are done by companies that have been in this industry and not just this industry, but in the banking industry, doing, doing due diligence for banks and for governments. Why is it different for us as opposed it's different for these larger countries? You know, we have to ask ourselves this. Most of these due diligence companies that we are employed, I am employing for these programs. Now, I'm not working in the government here, but from my knowledge and experience, a lot of these due diligence companies are actually based in the U.S., in the U.K., in Europe. Why, why are we scrutinizing their due diligence when you're using them for your own good? You know, That's a good it, point. It doesn't make any sense to me. And the governments need these programs. So I believe the programs would be here. And I believe these larger countries need to understand that, you know, we're on the receiving end of a lot of, of hardships, you know, when it comes to climate change and we, we get scrutinized for our offshore banking sector, our online gaming sector, we get scrutinized and we get shut down. So, right. I mean, what are we, third third class world citizens where we really, we, we can't live, the countries need to live, we need to progress. And we're using the same the same means of, of the same means that these other countries are using, these larger countries are using to, to process some of their applications. Those, and, those are all valid points, Kevin. Yeah. And, and, and you know, what's very important is these, these co uh, companies that we're using, they're using them. They're using them. They're based in your country. They're based. You exactly. have to honestly think that the Caribbean, they're doing a, good, a very good job here. They're, they're doing a good job at picking the persons that are eligible to, to proceed with, with obtaining a second citizenship. The countries, these Caribbean countries don't want to have persons that are not desirables. If they're not desirables and they, they, have, they have issues, that is not what they want. Now, out of a thousand, perhaps one may get through because it did not show up on their due diligence because it was not done in the future. We can't predict what persons are going to do when, when they get it. But that is that is something that we, we look at. We dive deep into their past, their history, to make sure that this is what the country wants. And it starts from persons like myself who are onboarding the clients. We do a, a background check on them to onboard them. And then from there, the bank does a background check on them. And then from there, the citizenship unit does a background check on them. At the end of it, we know their favorite color. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you, you're saying the processes are robust enough and the future for the Caribbean programs, including Antigua and Barbuda, do look bright and will continue to look bright. And certainly we all hope so, too. So thank you so much for taking out the time for our episode, Kevin. I really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And, and in the end, I would just want to shout out to our listeners that please stay tuned to our podcast. We'll be bringing you more guests from around the world to talk about more programs from all around the world. Thank you so much. Thank you.